Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Corey. I am with Roman's Book Soup, Roman's Bookstore. And tonight we have the pleasure of hosting Kate Bowler and Lori Gottlieb discussing No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. Before we get going, there's a little green button down at the bottom of your, of your page. It says Purchase Book. If you have yet to purchase the book, you can push that button and do so at any time during the event afterwards, or it's also on the Bromans Bookstore website. Um, you can also ask questions. There will be time for a Q&A. Also, at the bottom of your screen, there is a tab that says Ask a Question. Please put your questions there. That way, we can get to all of them. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our guests. So Lori Gottlieb is a psychotherapist and New York Times best-selling author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which has sold over a million copies and is currently being adapted as a television series for ABC. In addition to her clinical practice, she is co-host <clears throat> co for the popular Dear Therapist podcast produced by Katie Couric, and she writes the weekly Dear Therapist advice column in The Atlantic. She is a sought-after expert in media, such as the Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, CNN, and NPR's Fresh Air. <clears throat> She's also had a recent TED Talk that was one of the most top 10 watched of the year. Lori never goes to sleep at night. <laughs> Kate Bowler, Kate Bowler <laughs> PhD, is a professor at Duke University. She's a podcast host and a New York Times best-selling author. Her books include Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel, Everything Happens for a Reason, and Other Lies I've Loved. Her third book, The Preacher's Wife, <clears throat> The Precarious Power of the Evangelical Women's Celebrities, and her latest book, No Cure for Being Human, and Other Truths I Need to Hear. This grapples with her diagnosis, her ambition, and her faith as she tries to come to terms with the limitations in a culture that promises anything is possible. Kate's work is, has <clears throat> received widespread media attention from NPR, The Today Show, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The TED Stage, and Fresh Air with Terry Gross. These women are brilliant, they never sleep, they work all the time for all of us to come together and listen and be inspired. So I'm now going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Corey. Great. Thank, Thank you, Corey. They have no hobbies. <laughs> they have no life. They've never These traveled. poor women. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to clarify, we do sleep, just, just so you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you, Corey. That was so funny. That was great. We're both big fans of Terry Gross. Which is yes, so great. yes, 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 yes. Well, Kate, first of all, hi. I am so glad to be doing this with you and having this conversation about your exquisite new book. I'm holding it up here. No yes. cure for being human. There are also there's also a mug that unfortunately I left in the other room. But <laughs> yeah. if they're available, you should get one with your book. Um, this Thank book, so I was just telling Kate right before we we came on. Um, I would sit there and I would be crying. And then I would be laughing, and sometimes I would be laughing and crying at the same time. It is an exquisite book, um, and I want to give people some context. So I want to start off by asking you a little bit about your research area. So you are a professor and historian of self-help, which means you're an expert in the cultural cliches about empowerment and living our best lives. I never knew that was an academic discipline. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me neither. So, but I was like, this seems very compelling. Someone should write about this. Right. Yeah. And I'm glad you were the one who did. So tell me how and when you became interested in examining these cliches. And, and was there a point maybe even before the cancer diagnosis that you found them empowering or comforting or what motivated you to dive into this? Hmm. I, uh, well, I grew up around in the prairies of Winnipeg. And I saw that there's one person from Winnipeg here, which makes me so happy. It's not like a, it's not a common place to either visit or be from. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a, 
it's a place where I was surrounded by very um, a, a wonderful uh, religious tradition called the Mennonites, which had unbelievably low expectations for life. They uh, they typically moved in groups, were wonderful at suffering and communalists at heart. And so I, I went to a Mennonite church and I grew up among Mennonites who really didn't ever expect that everything was possible. And so when I saw this huge church, which I honestly thought was a factory pop up on the outskirts of town. And I um, saw these people pouring out. I was very uh, curious. And then I got very sort of um, over-involved and intrusive, as I do when I'm very interested in something intellectually, and uh, realized that it was um, what we might now call a prosperity church, which has had a it had a very charismatic believer uh, pastor who'd just been given a, a motorcycle, which he rode around on stage for a, a holiday called Pastor's Appreciation Day, and that they believed in health and wealth and happiness and had really sky high hopes for what uh, they could do. And I was so insistent that that was not for Canadians, that it was from it was for Americans. I was absolutely positive about it. So when I um, started going to school in the United States and began my graduate studies, it became a kind of puzzle, which is how do people create this kind of like what sort of oxygenates the atmosphere? What makes people create expectations of both their hopes, but also explain their sorrows? And um, and so I think even before, while I was studying, I had imagined that maybe it was kind of an exaggeration of what people might hope for. It was maybe a little, um, it was just like a bit much. And even though I tried to write like a very gentle history, but then uh, I think when I got sick was when I first started kind of wondering if maybe a lot of what they had believed had kind of seeped into my my thinking after all is that I am, um, Maybe I had a whole set of hopes and dreams that I had never really questioned and expectations that my life would always work out too. So what do you think were some of the common formulas for how to live and, and why do you think they were so compelling to people and, and still are? Yeah, well, I think well, much of it has to do with the shape of the American character over the last hundred years. So ever since Americans crowded into cities and they see tremendous wealth inequality, there's always been so like these the idea, this inflated sense of what we could do really began in the in the late nineteenth century. People have um every time there is inequality created a a theory of why some people rise and other people fall. And so one religious version of that became the thing that I started studying, which is called the prosperity gospel. But I realized that it was much wider than just the prosperity gospel, but it was this multi-strand um, set of expectations that we see in, um, in stories about the American dream, in stories uh, about bootstrapping and rugged individualism in these, um, in what we now kind of think of as new age, new thought, the secret, anyone who's ever visualized something and imagined their thoughts create reality. Um, but that all of this kind of became this web that every time we move, we kind of, we, we, we pull against it. And so I, all of those are very, are, are, are sort of sky high, overly American hopes about the human condition. And, um, I know there's there's versions of it elsewhere, but it really it really did become part of the American character so early on. Right. And it was so interesting because when you were diagnosed with cancer, you were 35 and you found out pretty quickly that you were one of the and I'm going to put this in big quotes, one of the lucky ones yeah. um, in the three percent group that might respond to a clinical trial of immunotherapy. And you it seemed like your reaction was you were very realistic about this fact that you had a 97% chance that this wouldn't work. And you were prepared for the not unlikely possibility that you would die in a few years. But it was interesting because the people around you, yeah. right, um, really didn't want to believe that in a lot of ways. And and I, I and I, it was interesting because you were very realistic in the term in terms of like, you were what, trying to make sure that everyone's life would be okay without you because you were planning for it not to work. Mm -hmm. So first, before we talk about other people's reactions, can you talk a little bit about how you tried to do that with your husband and your son 
and yeah. why you came to realize that trying to make things okay for other people in the event that you weren't here actually kept you from living. Mm. Yeah, I think immediately my mind sort of split into two tracks. And one of them was the one without me. And one was this sort of, I think, just hope and also just the impossibility of ever imagining that I would die. It was like a thought that my brain would just sort of break against. So there was, it was just kind of a split mind. And so every day in a way I was trying to sort of live two lives is one that I, I, I just, every time I looked at them, I just thought, well, the most compassionate thing you can do is, is be the person that does all the paperwork, be the person that, um, tries to make sure they have mon enough money and resources and that mostly that nobody fights and that everybody loves each other and that has like all the kind of like, there's no drama. And, um, and meanwhile, you know, anyone who's been through a crisis knows that's usually the time when you're actually managing the most drama is like, yeah. everybody's kind of in the mix. And so I had sort of, it was, I had sort of family visiting cause I am Canadian. So people, I just, I don't have any family around. So people were in and out and I'm, I'm noticing that I'm in a way like trying to create a civilization without me in which everybody has enough, like everybody has enough relational capital. I don't pick fights. I, I just, I let, I let go of my own uh, place in their story. I got pictures taken. Like it was really, it was really awful. I stopped buying clothes. I mean, it was, it was really awful. And it was so, um, it was all done out of love. Um, but it, it took, and then there's other bit where I would just like imagine that I would live the way I thought I would. Like I, I picked this really ridiculous profession where you study for 10 years and then it's supposed to pay off, right? Like you're supposed to live till you're 80 and have this fleet of grateful graduate students who look to you and be like, tell me more about your footnotes. So I, I just, so I, I, um, in the meantime, I was like scrambling to keep up a version of a life that made any sense. So not just enduring medical treatment, but like, didn't I want to have a job and didn't I, didn't I ever have plans? Also, do I not, maybe not want to be a garbage friend and keep remembering other people's birthdays, even though my life is exploding. So I, uh, I just found that I couldn't opt uh, that both those two tracks just had a way of ballooning and, and that the one in which I die was, um, was unsustainable because, uh, there was just like in a, in a day I would wake up in the morning and I remember it would, it sometimes my, my mind would break on stuff like, uh, should I use scar cream for my mm -hmm. surgical incisions? Cause in one version, I mean, what's the point? And in the other, shouldn't I treat my body like it is still mine? So every, every version had too many choices. And, uh, and soon I realized that you can't, you can't even have relationships with people if you're not still in them. So the first time I yelled at my sister, I think was the first time I realized, oh, maybe I, maybe I plan on betting on, on myself in this moment. She wasn't right. as thrilled, but I, she wasn't as thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But I, but I think that that's, that's so true. Um, you know, and I think it's it's interesting because when you're 35 and this happens, you have this great line in the book that you said something like, I'm going to misquote this so you can correct me, but it was something, you know, in crisis, everyone's an accountant. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. You know, this idea of, well, you know, it's one thing if someone who's 85 has cancer, right? Who has cancer that looks like it's, it's stage four and it, it's very serious, right? Um, but for someone who's 35, people don't know how to how to treat you, how to wrap their heads around that, right? Um, you know, and then and then this idea, and I wonder what that was like for you, where you know people thought, well, she's 35 and she has a husband and a young child, versus yeah. she's 85 or she's yeah. 35 but she's not married, or she's 35 but she's married but she doesn't have children, right? Yeah. So this accounting, I love that phrase in the book that you had, yeah. and I noticed that too did people treat do you yeah. feel like you got m more um like people paid more attention to trying to get you better because of the way we have this accounting system around what is the value of a human life mm -hmm. i think it was um yeah I, I, find, I find the math so pernicious i really do yeah. like there is no outside math that decides the 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 beauty and the 
the absurd uniqueness of our of our lives like there is but and the the math kind of had i didn't find it usually came on my side i mean i know that people were like oh her life adds up and therefore it's a tragedy you know so i i think i counted as a tragedy but i don't think that the math really ever worked in my favor and i don't think it works in anyone's favor which is that whatever the math is they're trying to everyone is sometimes out of love and sometimes out of absurd you know, just, they're just like reaching for whatever explanation they have, but like there isn't the attempt to add it up was really painful. So, um, I can tell you're going to lose everything that matters to you. And let's say it's a, it's a trying to be a Christian response and you are, you know, you have a belief in the afterlife. Therefore, Heaven is going to be amazing to make up for everything you're losing now. Like, it's like they put the past, the present, and the future, and they were trying to make all those add up. Or like my, or my past would make it okay for my present to, to and future to disappear. So they'd say, well, at least you had a son. Like, I guess everything's, I guess, you did it. You had, you had the life you wanted. Like, and now this is all part of the like weird attempts for us because we're scared, I guess, is, um, is that we can't imagine that that things would be wasted or that some things would be for no reason or that, but the, and it wasn't just, I mean, it was both spiritualizing and, um, and, and just a, a deep rationalizing is, is the hope that, uh, that the hope that, that, yeah, that, that it will all add up. And if it isn't that there's a, that there's a formula we can get you on to make it add up. So either God will have a plan or just really be present Lori, the present mindedness people are just killing me lately. Like if like, then my, then my moments will add up, then my present will add up. So it doesn't matter then that I don't have a future. It's a wild right. kind of math and all of right. it. And are, by, yeah. Tell me. No, I was just going to say, and by the way, the present was, you know, you're getting a port, you're flying on an airplane every week to go get chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Like the yeah. present wasn't great. No. So, yeah. The, you know, the present was not, was, was not a great you know, present to be in. <laughs> That's um, exactly right. Yeah. But I was thinking about what you were just saying about, you know, how people needed to make it okay somehow, you know, that whole, like your first book, everything happens for a reason. And it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and, and I, there's these, you know, just the writing in the book, like there's just these the beautiful passages that just tell the truth. And one of them was you were um, talking about how in the few times that you cried in front of your doctors, that they would, and literally say something like, you know, will I make it through the summer? That they could not tolerate that conversation with you, that they would change the subject. They, they wouldn't go there with you. They tried to kind of of spin on things yeah how do you how, can you talk a little bit you, you talk beautifully in the book about this can you share with people how you think about that yeah i you know and i, I was so grateful that i could practice writing it because i was i was struggling with that feeling like i like there was some kind of formula and it was never adding up to the particularity of who i was like so i was in this clinical trial and every bit about me is being measured my blood work and my i'm a Oh no. Oh no, Lori is gone. Guys. Oh, no. Hi. I'm here. Oh, you're there back. Go. Hey. I, I was here. <laughs> oh, super. Um <laughs> like the 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 rationalization and that for instance in a clinical trial I'm technically part of an experiment in which there in which certain people get a certain protocol, some people get certain medications, other people don't, some live and some die. And in all of it I, I understand the um, the cold math of rationality. I really do, but in all of it, I felt um, I felt really disposable because I I just felt like in all of those numbers, like I was lost. I was lost somewhere in there. And every time I would ask for it, I understand that doctors are trained to speak in probabilities. Like it's a very it's a very but it's a very slippery language and meanwhile i'm just trying to say like could you give me a little more so i can figure out what it means cuz i'm making all these choices about and everyone's looking at me to make all these choices and meanwhile i am just i am just gone somewhere how did you handle that uncertainty and and fear with not only just in your own soul but, but with, with your husband. 
I, part of it wasn't, um, part of it was I just toggled really fast. So I would, I would try to draw boundaries around the worlds that I had that I tried to manage them separately as best I could. Laura, you'll have to tell me if that was a good or a bad idea to have a non-integrated <laughs> version of my life. Cause I, I kept hospital. I, I had to, when I had to travel, especially for medical travel, I tried to draw a clean line because I was scared that it would just bleed over into everything. And I wanted the rest of my life. So I, I would like be gone from 3 45 AM to midnight that day. And then I would get up the next day and I would try to move quickly into the rhythm. Cause I was like a really a mom of a really little kid. So it was yeah. always just like immediately it's like diapers and baths and naps and he smells so good. Like he just, he's such a good smelling kid. And we both have a Zach and the Zachs are the best. Yes, yes. I think they the are kind, obviously, of child. And so part of it was like his you know, Kelly Corgan. All five senses, you know, and I did mm -hmm. kind of let it was one of my only good ways of being grounded in in myself is that he was because I because I was taking care of him. So I was right back in that. Um, but I found the uh, otherwise the. I was like very good at 2 p.m. I was really scared at 2 a.m. And I almost found that I was sort of different, different people um, based on who I let myself be honest around. But my family, I think I lied to the most because I just, I couldn't, I couldn't picture a version where I was a present mom and a good partner and, and that I was like hospital Kate. I just couldn't picture it. Right. Like the 3 a.m. of the soul. Yes. Yeah, the exactly. famous, right? exactly. Yes, Lori. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. It's it, when I think about the way you sort of compartmentalize that and thought about time. Um, you write in the book about three kinds of time, yeah. and I had never thought about time in those ways. You know, we think about sort of like past, present, future, and you write about um, you know these three other ways of looking at time. Can you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, it was from my friend Luke. I was um, I was talking. I was think I was complaining about people who um, complain about things as I'm because I'm generous and kind that way, and, um, and he was like, "Oh, Kate, that's." you've been living in tragic time, like the, mm -hmm. the brightness of it, the, that crystalline clarity, both good and bad that comes right after something has happened where you remember it's that, yeah, like you're in your own slow-mo. Um, I've always found that I'm like pretty good at that kind of time as I get laser focused on what I love. And, um, but that there's other kinds of time. There's there's ordinary time. There's like what farmers do: sowing and reaping and tending and an email and making lunches and being stuck in traffic. And and that ordinary time is also good. And it's like it's okay to be in ordinary time. I don't just have to imagine um, like those big moments as being like real time. And that there's also apocalyptic time when um you know we feel this when we think about the environment or the the need for justice that that we have binaries uh, suddenly and that the the world feels like we're just teetering on the edge of a cliff and people like i i mean in my american religion history lectures i always like 1844 people just hide out in a cliff and uh, in a cave and they're very disappointed when they come out in the world it's the same but it's the feeling that you would you i mean that money doesn't matter that you would pay anything because you're at the end of what we know and and each are really uh, precious in their insight, but none of them are places where you can really live forever without missing something. Right. I think a lot of people are curious about your relationship with faith, um, especially going through this. And I think that relates a little bit to time also, because, yeah. you know, you're saying so many different things. And what I love about your book is that you're able to hold all these very different kinds of ideas um, at the same time. And, and really, it really makes all of us think about our own lives and kind of wonder about, you know, how are we living our lives? You know, COVID did that, I think, for a lot of us. Yeah. I think your book does that a lot for all of us. And, you know, I always say as a therapist, like, we shouldn't need a tragedy to, um, you know, like, wake up. <laughs> so, and then we, yeah, we always do. Yeah, I know. Um, totally. a crisis. Yeah. Um, and so, 
I know a lot of people are curious about this. How do you, you know, how do you hold on to this idea of, you know, what does what is God to you? What was God to you during this time? Um, how do you think about faith, and how do you think about um, how this all comes together when sort of the unimaginable happens? Yeah, and things seem really unfair. Yes, yeah, completely unfair. I, I guess I think about it a lot in part because I'm a, a historian of religious thought, and also I work um, at in, I work at Duke University, but in the seminary where it's mostly do-gooding pastors and nonprofit types, and so just people worry that they'll die of empathy, you know, at some point. And I um, and I, I guess. Uh, so one of the one of the great joys and one of the great pains of all of this has been the element of faith is one of the great pains of it was that people tended to apply their like saddle me with the hard questions like the hardest questions I think which is why why is why does um justice and fairness and all things seem to evade some why do some people get to be miserable and terrible and live a million years on a yacht that says too blessed to be stressed, which is a real yacht I saw at one point. And it was like, yeah, I, why is the great unfairness of the world um, so obvious in some people's lives? And I felt like when people were trying to explain my suffering or ask me to explain it, that they were trying to make me bear the weight of their big questions is that they wanted God to be a plan. They wanted it to be certain they wanted a feeling of assurance. And I, I've never, I've never experienced that. I really haven't. It's just, um, I think the surreal part of my experience was that in the moment of greatest uncertainty, which is that I thought that I would die in a few months, that I felt so intensely loved, like really loved by my community. I felt really weirdly loved by God and none of it felt like certainty not even a little. It didn't feel like I had a formula or a plan or that I'd been good or that there was a way to improve my life or it just felt that I had, um, that, uh, God draws near the suffering. And that was just, that was my ex experience of, um, of love. And so tell, tell me yeah. more about that. I I'm really, I'm really struck by that idea that like, in your worst moment when you thought you were going to die yeah. that you felt god's love yeah. most intensely help help me understand yeah. that and you can see me squirm a little because i um you know before i was very like i'm a historian Lori. i'm a very serious person and i do not describe my subjective experiences um i uh i just i remember waking up from surgery i remember uh remember someone held out a picture of um, my son on my phone that like was just like, and I remember thinking I don't get to be that kid's mom. And, um, and I just remember not feeling like I was going to fall all the way to the bottom of any of those thoughts that I would feel carried. And I really did. I felt really, really carried through those few months in particular, like kind of just like bubble wrapped. Like, even if I could tell I was on the edge of being really scared that I wasn't not nearly as scared or not nearly as angry or not nearly as like despairing as I knew that I really should be. And, uh, because, and so, because, because God was protecting you or God was holding you or what? Yeah. I felt weirdly, um, yeah, like precious even though I felt really disposable. Like you wake up and like your abdomen isn't your abdomen and you just have bandages everywhere and your first shower is just very Franken body. And you're like, who, who's, who's this? Who's is this exactly? Like who's going to claim responsibility for what happened here? And yeah. And, and I came home to a house where none of my belongings felt like mine. Like I looked at my stuff and I was like, Oh, I should probably, I should probably get rid of most of that. Cause you know, this is none of this is something my husband's going to want to keep like in the midst of feeling like everything had to go. Like what, what kinds of things I remember in the book, you talk about like, you know, coming to terms with not having another child 
and yeah. getting rid of the maternity clothes. But what were some of the things that felt like not yours or not you that all you got books. rid of? Yeah, all my books, all my work, anything. Um, yeah, books, clothes, hmm. personal things. And and what do you mean by this sense of um, they weren't you? Meaning like you had profoundly changed as a person going through well, this? I, think I was just kind of in that full track where I was like, well, if I'm gone, like this house doesn't need to have, I need to kind of move out. Mm. But so even in that feeling, like I, like the world wasn't mine anymore. That's, I felt, um, yeah, weirdly permanent in God's love. And that is a weird thing to say, but I kind of knew it was a little weird. So I brought, I brought it up with a bunch of friends, like theologian friends. I was like, Hey, so having if you a, were dying, <laughs> a strange feeling about this. And they were like, Oh yeah. I, they, um, talked about how they'd, uh, read about it in lovely works of theology and that some had called it like the sweetness or feeling of light but they were like oh yeah it'll it'll go like that feeling will pass and um it really did and i guess that's partly why i wanted to write um no cure for being human instead of just kind of staying in the in the intensity of the crisis because when it when it went and when my life just continued i realized i was going to have to learn to live without necessarily the lovely wonderful feelings or the bright certainty or the like without the existential clarity that i would just have to learn to live in the ordinary wonderful terrible drudgery of it all and i think that was kind of in a way what that big moment taught me was that it was true and it was there but then life like just then life right and that and that learning to live with life as that chronic condition was going to take a little a different kind of wisdom and certainly a different kind of courage that i'd had to have until that previous yeah until that time if that makes sense oh yeah it does do you it was it's interesting that you bring up your body um and you also just said chronic condition so do you think of this now where you are as a chronic condition like yeah. at any moment yeah. anything could happen and also you've been through your body has been through so much you've had yeah. multiple surgeries you're missing body parts <laughs> um, you know, your liver filtration <laughs> organs which i <laughs> yeah yeah right so so um you know i wonder is is that kind of a reminder to you in some ways that you know, when you look at your body or you know that, you know, you're missing things that you used to have, um, that, that it tethers you somehow to this idea of impermanence, that it tethers you to this idea of, you know, not getting too comfortable. Um, and, and how do you think about this in terms of being a chronic condition now that it's been, yeah. I think, several years since, um, you know, the yeah. tumors have been gone? Well, because it's a yes and a no on health is I continue to have to have scans and it's not just kind of wait and see scans. I'm kind of on the like Smokey the Bear. I'm not green and I'm not red. I'm in sort of like there may be forest fires kind of middle range. And so, so because I still have to sort of remain vigilant in order to just maintain my health, um, like I'm not a survivor I don't, I'm not like in the after category. I, um, I do kind of accept that as a bit of like a, just like a citizenship. It's like, that's kind of where we all live one way or the other is we've all lost things. We've all not necessarily gotten all the things we hoped for. We live in an aftermath of um, all kinds of people we thought we would be. And that that version feels a little bit more honest to me than the trying to either rush back to the maybe shinier version that I was and, and also being a little more speaking of embodiment, like, yeah, like carrying, carrying it with me. I'm just like pointing at all the stuff, but like, it's the, you know, I am on my, like, I am this like full on my ninth belly button and everyone gets worse. Each belly button has gotten less decorative than the last one. And I, uh, I want to, um, I, I guess I, I always find like when I'm in the cancer center, 
which is every few months for something rather. I just, it takes me a minute, but then I feel like I settle in and I'm like, I feel like I'm seeing, I'm seeing the world as it is one way or the other, not just with cancer, but with, with just the pain that cracks everybody open. And I feel like it's a more, it, it opens me up to the compassion that I want to have for the, the world as it is. And that kind of becomes my prayer is just like, God, just let me see the world as it is. And chronic feels like the word that best describes that to me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like life is a chronic condition that that we all are living in this chronic condition of, of as you say, being human. Um, one of the things that was really remarkable about your book, and we're gonna, if people have questions, please put them in the ask a question, cause we're gonna get to those in just a minute. One of the things that, that was so striking about your book was it was on the one hand, this very realistic look at our lives and the fragility of our lives and the preciousness of our lives at the same time. Um, and on the other hand, it was an incredibly, as much as I cried, it was an incredibly hopeful book. Okay. Um, Can you talk to us a little bit about hope in the face of even yeah. everything you've gone through? Yeah, I guess um, it took me a bit to get around to hope because as a historian of positive thinking and self-help and I'd really um, imagined that it was the same thing as optimism. And if mm -hmm. I no longer believe that my life is certain or necessarily that my life will work out the way that I really hoped, like in, in what way does, what does it mean to be hopeful? And I guess that kind of brings me back to the, the belief in um, love and the need for courage is that like once we are attempting to be cur courageous and see the world as it is, then like, then what now? And I think um, for me, hope is an uh, anchor dropped in the future. And I, I believe that it's a story about love that we are being drawn toward in which there will be no more tears. And, and in, some, in some future world that nothing will be wasted. But in the meantime, um, I think hope for me now feels like more than just hope that my life will work out, but that but that it's a story. Um, it's a story about love. That's about. It's not just about me, but it's about all of us. So we're going to get to some questions in just a second. But my last question before we do um, is: I think a lot of people reading your book, and I think it it resonates, you know, very universally. So I'm Jewish. We believe in everything's catastrophic and like the future is awful, and like until we're proven otherwise. So it's it's kind of like you know, don't count your chickens. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. don't don't get too excited about something until it happens and and your philosophy is is like you know like in some future time there will be no tears there will be this you know there will be mm -hmm. that um for people like me and there are i'm sure thousands and thousands of readers of your books uh both of them that are like me um and and it really i really responded to the book even though we may look at that future differently yeah. um what would you say to people like that in terms of how your book is relevant to all of our lives and not just your experience? Because I found it to be incredibly relevant. Oh, thanks, Lori. I guess my my hope for me and my hope for everyone is that when we have thicker categories for our for our fragility, for our um for our hungers and hopes and fears of not enoughness, that we can be um we can create like a, a gentler space for ourselves that is that moves kind of away from the exhausting everything is possible, but doesn't fall into the but then nothing is possible. And and like if we I think if we can be have more space for limited agency for this place between, then I um I think we'll be more comfortable with the kind of interdependence that you and I both really care about is that when we give up on perfection and individualism and endless self-making, I think we're going to be better at looking deeply and uncomfortably into each other's eyes and, um, and knowing that we need each other to carry each other forward. So, yeah, I'm just like, um, just really hoping for a strong anti self-help pro interdependence <laughs> desire for everybody. Right. And this idea you, you, you write about. So, so, um, like, 
strikingly accurately at the beginning of the book about, you know, this idea of like live your best life and this illusion of control. And I think what you went through is a masterclass in dealing with our lack of control and yet also having agency and holding those two things at the same time. So um, let, I know people have tons of questions, so we are going to start asking some of those. I'm going to look here. Um, oh, we have so many questions. Okay. We will get to as many as we can. Um, I just want to remind people, I just have to do this because I love this book. And I, I said to Kate earlier, like, love is a weird word for this book, but it it's profound. Um, so if you haven't gotten the book yet, I just want to remind you. And um, okay, so somebody asked, I love this question. Um, how do you keep your anxiety at bay? Mm. I think we all have dealt with so much anxiety over mm -hmm. un with uncertainty lately. And you had the experience of, of really yeah. being in the trenches with anxiety. Can you talk yeah. to us about that? Yeah. Yes. And always, I think our, our resident expert here would say that asking for help and finding professional help is always um, the right, uh, always a wonderful idea if you, if, if anyone is really worried that their anxiety has become more than they can manage. I am, um, I found that, um, I mean, that part of what was giving me so much anxiety, frankly, was that I had so few places to be, to speak honestly. Is that ever, I found that when I was in public or, or even, I mean, just around people who love me, that I was, I was um, like performing a really exhausting and untrue positivity. And my assurances were just actually making me feel more and more separate from my real experience, which was that I was really scared. And um, I have had a bad habit. I continue to have a bad habit of when I'm scared of something, I wall it off and I don't ask for the help that I need. And then I find I kind of fall into it and then I'm overwhelmed. So I find preparing in the, in a gentler way for things that are scary has been a gift. If I know something is going to make me nervous, I try to do ridiculous things that I think Anne Lamott would say we should do. Like everyone should have a snack and everyone should make sure they have a beverage. And it's okay to kind of wall out the world a little bit with music that you really like and just kind of giving yourself again, the regulative things that help you be present to yourself. Um, I also really like something that my friend Hillary McBride, who's a psychologist does. She has this really adorably comforting voice and she kind of just like coaches herself through sort of hard moments where she's like, Hey, I noticed that that seems really, and she just kind of gives herself a little narration and um, Self -talk. I love a good, Turns out I need to externalize those feelings. And I I was I was going into a only an a, a medium scary procedure the other day. And I was like, hey there, Ivy, looks like you're doing a good job. And I just like I I do find it it helps. It helps kind of because the always the strange moment I find with anxiety is that we're not sure whether we should fight or let go. And so often we actually do have to make a choice. So letting yourself create a little more comfort to know when you're supposed to, when you're supposed to act and when you have to surrender. That's, that seems like tricky, tricky work. And the grounding, right? The grounding that you're doing, um, just being in the present and naming it and narrating it. Um, so useful. Yeah. Somebody wants to know, how did you transition from being so close to death to entering back into the world of the yeah. living? Yeah, I was, there was a bumpy, there's some bumpy, <laughs> it was a bumpy road. <laughs> Cause uh, yeah, I mean, some of it, I, some of it is skills that I'm glad I kept. Like I'm very, I'm better at having, uh, it sounds weird, but I am better at having fun than I was because I find that surreal things happen to me. So I accept the surrealness of things. Like the other day I was just skip over this, Lori, bit bitten by a poisonous copperhead. And when I was in the hospital- Wait, you want me to skip over that? <laughs> Wait a hospital, minute. I was, How does that happen? I was being envenomated. And um, I uh, and I was like, gosh, this is really horrible. It's super painful. I wonder if anyone I know works with sharks. And like cut to two weeks later, I'm like pulling dinosaurs out of the ocean. And I so one thing that I have found is helpful is um, I let myself- chase after surprise and joy. And that did help me in the transition from the terribleness 
to the normalness is it let me be good at a certain frequency, which is nuts. I'm good at it. Um, but the, the rest was letting, trying to, um, trying to be honest about the resentfulness that I felt that some people had, uh, had been untouched and that some people might never be affected in that way. And that some people would never know. And they didn't want to hear about it. Like letting people not know what I'd paid was um, letting people live in the world that they are. Mm. And, uh, I found that I was more resentful than I was being honest about. It's like you have the kind of like must be nice sort of feeling. I remember crying in my car because I saw two very normal people eating salads. <laughs> I was like, I can't eat a salad. Why are they just eating salads? And then the other day I marched by the same place with, with salads. And I was like, okay, so we're all we're all toggling between these different seasons of our life. So allowing myself to be honest about the loneliness and the resentfulness and also letting myself realize I I was actually that I had skills now that would serve me well were probably good good moments of discernment for me I think so many people talk about people who are going through cancer as you know they're they're so brave they're saints they're you know and it's like uh no and um and so when you talk about the resentment and you write about that in the book. Um, you have this great moment in the book where you say that, um, you know, so many people say, well, look, you have gratitude now for, you know, you see the world differently. The world is vivid to you. And, 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 you know, like, aren't you glad that like now you see the world so this way and you wrote that you have this great line where you said, no, actually the before was better. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that line. I literally laughed out loud when I read that. It was like, it's like, what kind of fiction are people trying to make up yeah. um, to make themselves feel better or to alleviate their own discomfort? And so somebody asked a question here, does the term survivor make you uncomfortable? And I know you just mm. said that you are not yet in that place yeah. where you feel like that, but there, I'd love to hear, I think a lot of people would like to hear, what are some way, What are some of the things that you wish people had said to you instead of what they said to you? Mm. Yeah. You know, what are some ways that you wish that they could interact with you when you were being honest or when you were really scared or some yeah. of the ways that you, you were hoping they could actually that you could feel felt that you they could be with you in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um I uh some of it is just um minimizing. So no at least at least I'm this at least yeah. you're that. Um very rarely did I need solutions. So I didn't often need essential oils that someone had recently purchased from a friend or um or I have not yet seen the recent documentary <laughs> you have seen. So less like teaching and less solutions, a more loving presence and just literal, I mean, presence are always like just the hilarious, dumb, small reminders that people think of you. But I, um, there's like a few to this time that I, um, like if, if you say, wow, it really hurt me that I just remember, um, I was in a I was in a, a a gathering of people who loved me and no one acknowledged no one acknowledged it. I mean, I didn't want it's not like I wanted a speech, but I just um I remember everyone I remember someone praying. Um thank you God that we had all had such a great year. And I remember thinking, I sort of almost died this year and it feels <laughs> wasn't the greatest. I, I feel like it wasn't great and and I was frustrated. I was like, you know, it really hurt my feet. I was like, it really, it kind of really hurt. And the immediate response was, well, everyone's doing their best. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't imagine that is universally true that everyone is always doing their best at all times and just allowing me to be disappointed or not grateful for a moment or have some of the more unpleasant feelings, letting me just be like petty for a hot minute because it does help me get back to benevolence. Um, but I, uh, I, yeah, I, or like a lot of like, let go and let God, I was like, let God do what exactly? Like, is, is God going to do my taxes? Like what, what is he going to do? I, 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 I found that a lot of the things that were meant to be loving, um, like this too shall pass. It's like, I'm not, I'm <laughs> I'm also not sure what that what that means. I mean, maybe the cancer's gone, but I I may not be here at the time. So I found that all the cliches were um were just always a bit too tidy. 
And what I, I just loved it when people said things like, um, um, with, um, I don't know if you want to share, but I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful to be with you or, uh, like a nice thing, a loving thing without sounding eulogized. That was always very nice. Or just like the, the gift of someone being close. But the truth is honestly, Larry is like, this is how I always feel when I look at you is I can tell you're not scared. And people can always tell when you're scared of their pain. And so just to be willing to be up close with someone without making them carry your, the weight of, of their response is like always the great, always the great gift. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because even as a therapist, I, I was scared mm. and, you know, I, I, I wrote in my own book about yeah. treating someone young with cancer and how in the beginning I didn't know how to deal with the in your faceness of the specter of death that was in the room between us. Yeah. And I wonder for you if um, if you feel like, you know, that there was there was a time when you couldn't even do that with yourself. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. like like was there a time because I, I think yeah. that having having cancer is so lonely. It's so lonely because everyone thinks that they know what you're going through and they don't. And, and I wonder if there was a time when, when people were denying your experience so much that you couldn't even get in touch with it. And, and I think that that's relatable to all of us just in terms of anything that we're going through. When you feel like no one knows that this is my experience. Yes. One of the things your book does is it just makes us start to talk about things. Mm. Thanks, Laurie. I, Honestly, Laura, I don't think I've been easy. I, I I tried to be easy to know, but I'm not sure I was because I felt, um, I just felt like this, the things that were easier to say would make me more lovable, would make me easier to be around. And I wanted those relationships to stay intact the way they were. I was afraid that if I made people pay for how hard my life was, that they, they wouldn't want to be there. And I know that's not true, but it really felt true. And I mean, some people leave and they do, but other people stay. And um, I guess that's partly why I've been grateful to write is it's gotten given me an opportunity to um, try to give a sense of the the world of, of um, wanting not to be on the other side of plexiglass is wanting everyone to be together in this sort of like citizenship of, of being human. We just have a couple more questions. Um, one question is, um, uh, when a crisis wakes us up, is it usual that we, something again soon, that we dose again soon? Um, maybe we go back again soon? Did that happen to you and when? I'm like not sure. We, like we need another like um, experience of it to stay as awake, mm. I wonder? Maybe. Um, Maybe. I, uh, yeah, I, the thing like, do you feel, do you feel like, do you, I, I guess what my interpretation of this question is that when you, um, so the crisis sort of wakes us up to something and then we sort of get complacent, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, how do you, how do you maintain sort of like the, the, like whatever you were woken up to, how do yeah. you maintain that when you're not in a crisis mode? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I I guess part of uh what keeps me feeling very awake is um is knowing that the more we love the more we keep breaking our own hearts and how unbelievably beautiful that is to feel so scared that we're going to lose something that we can't bear to live without it. And I have a few feelings like that in my life with um when I stare at my kid when he's sleeping, when I hear my friends um, complain about an ex-boyfriend with specificity that brings me incredible joy, <laughs> like when I feel myself in the deep story of my life, that makes me, uh, it seems unimaginable that I could live in any other place at any other time except loving them. And I want to be, uh, that's the feeling I want to keep is the feeling of being so in love that this will hurt like hell. Mm. And uh, that that is a pain I wish on everybody, everywhere, <laughs> is, uh, that we all just have our big dumb hearts. And 
And you said it so beautifully too, that like love is in the mundane moments. Yeah. Um, well, Kate, um, everybody again, the book, No Cure for Being Human. There is no cure for being human. And that's a good thing. Uh, I hope you all get to read her book. And what a pleasure to have this conversation with you and to be able to share all of this with all of the good people um, from Vromans. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you to Lori and thank you for this lovely opportunity. I really appreciate you tuning in at night or medium night, depending on where you are. Yes. Yes. And I think Corey's got a few closing words here. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Lori. That was beautiful. Thanks, guys. Uh, um, and we have a lot of thank yous coming in from the audience. I think everybody had a really good time. Thanks, love. So, and yes, um, there's a replay for those of you who have come in late. Or if you want to share it with someone, you can go to romansbookstore.com. Go to their events and look for past events. Or you can go to the Crowdcast um, into Romans Live. And they also have past events. So you can hit the replay button and watch it again. And you can purchase your book now or during the replay or also on the website. And the little green button down there at the bottom of your screen for that book. And I think that's a wrap. Is there anything else you guys would like to share before we go? Thank you, just guys. thank you, Kate, for, for sharing yourself with, with everybody. Lori, you gorgeous creature. I'll keep you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.